Welcome to today's uh, version of the ultrasound lecture series. We're going to be talking about ultrasound guided nerve blocks. Um, so this is one of the things that we've been working on in the department. And I know last week or the week before, week before, we had one of our anesthesia rotators give us a little bit of a presentation about some of the specific blocks that um, that we can do. Uh, and so I'm going to want to back up a little bit and get a little more big picture uh, discussion about ultrasound guided nerve blocks and some of the physiology behind it, some of the anatomy. Um, so as we pursue this initiative departmentally, uh, we can have some of the, the foundational work um, in place uh, to know kind of what we're doing. So with that being said, let's get rolling here. Uh, we'll spend the, the duration of this hour talking about uh, ultrasound and blocking nerves and doing some regional anesthesia. So let's pretend that we're working uh, in the ED. I guess it could be Maine, it could be West, but probably West because that tends to be the, the, the less acute area, right? Uh, and we see a patient who comes in that looks like this, right? So the, um, not a terribly uncommon presentation, you know, someone got mad, they punched a wall um, and the wall won, right? So we have a boxer's fracture. Uh, so this patient obviously needs reduced, um, you know, and that's reduction is quite a, quite a painful procedure. Um, also imagine yourself, um, you know, walking out of that room and you have some dude that was um, doing some construction work um, who is not quite adept with using a nail gun and stuck a nail through their finger into a piece of wood. So you see this, right? So this is going to require some intervention, uh, on our part. And, uh, it's going to require some pain control, uh, in the process of doing, doing the procedure. And, um, you know, finally imagine you're working down, you got called down to the trauma bay and you had some, I don't know, person who got bit by a pit bull or something like that. Um, or some other industrial incident. Um, and they have, uh, almost a degloving injury of a portion of their hand, right? So very, another painful uh, injury. And all three of these are going to require some form of procedure to put them back to new, to get Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, but it's going to be painful in the process. And there's a number of options for how we can manage that, how we can take care of the pain. Um, and they you know, range from, you know, let's say, let's throw a pill at them, right? So we can give them any number of medications, uh, PO or, um, or even parenteral, we can give them, you know, parental or, um, analgesia. And for some patients, we'll actually sedate them, right? You know, this shouldn't be new and revelatory. You know, we sedate kids all the time for, for painful procedures. But each of these have their drawbacks, right? Um, a couple of years ago, I haven't seen recent data. Um, Joan Papp could probably provide this for me, but a couple of years ago, we were kind of at the height of the opiate uh, crisis. And I know Chuck, you could probably comment a little bit too with what you guys are seeing with the addiction medicine, um, you know, fellowship in your addiction medicine program in terms of what the numbers are looking at now. But essentially, uh, giving opiate pain medications, uh, while it can be helpful in certain circumstances, creates a real problem, especially if this has to be done over a long period of time, uh, is as op there's, a, there's a risk of those opiates becoming or developing a tolerance, uh, and then even potentially an addiction uh, for the patients. And actually, if you want an interesting read um, about that, Travis, I think it's Travis Reader, Ryder, Reader uh, R-E-I-D-E-R, I think is the way you spell it, uh, wrote an interesting book called In Pain. I read that this last year, I actually reached out and um, emailed him and you know, expressed my appreciation for him writing a story, but basically a bioethicist at John Hopkins who got into a really nasty motorcycle wreck and described his experience recovering from that, but ultimately developing a tolerance to opiates um, and the, the challenge that he had to get himself off opiates uh, in the process of recovering from his painful events. So uh, this certainly has been a big issue uh, on the forefront of our practice over the last several years. We've tried to reduce the amount of opiates that we, that we prescribe and give to patients. Um, and I know several years ago, five or six years ago, there was the initiative to have the opiate-free ED. And while it you know, will never be 100% fully realized as a reality, I think the, the, the goal of reducing the amount of um, you know, PO or parenteral pain medication or narcotic pain medications is, is, a, is a laudable and admirable um, process. And so there's a lot of options that we can give, whether it be IV lidocaine, low-dose ketamine, you know, some of these non-traditional clonidine, gabapentin, pregabalin, um, you know, medication or trigger point injections, or now that we have nitrous op, you know, opportunity um, in ED West, or even regional pain, as, regional anesthesia, which is kind of the, the approach that we're going to take today. Uh, as we seek to find 
safer ways, um, non-narcotic ways of, of treating patients' pain uh, in the ED, particularly for acute pain. Um, this will be less so for chronic pain, but particularly for acute painful procedures. So with that being said, we're going to talk about ultrasound-guided nerve blocks uh, over the course of the next um, you know, time that we have together. I've uh, got no disclosures to, to make. And the objectives today are going to talk about why nerve blocks, which is kind of what we just did, um, talk about nerve anatomy a little bit, uh, fundamentals of nerve blocks, you know, all things that will prep us then to discuss a few peripheral blocks that we're going to do uh, that we can do easily in the forearms. And over the course of the next, you know, several months and year or so, um, you know, unveil some other, you know, bigger, uh, bigger blocks. And I've been starting to do some more of these in the ED. Um, and they're quite fun, right? And they've also, you can have a profound effect. We had a couple rib fracture patients we did. And one of them, um, you know, is I think a recent holiday, whatever, um, you know, took a tumble due to some uh, iatrogenic inebriation um, and had a rib fracture and a small pneumo. And so we figured this is a pretty, pretty easy um, block to do in that there was not a lot of complications because she already gave herself the pneumo and we did a serratus anterior block and she had pain control before we even got the needle out. And so it was quite impressive, you know, how, how much improved the patient was, um, you know, in the short duration of time that we were able to block her and, and, and help her out. So with that being said, let's move forward here. So the idea of a nerve block, right? Big picture, if we think about like fundamentally in an elevator pitch, what are we doing, right? The, in essence, we are taking a certain anesthetic agent, right? And injecting it in the vicinity of a nerve to block the nerve's conduction. So we say, nerve, you're causing pain, no mass, and, um, you know, and we're going we're gonna to block that. Now, unfortunately, by blocking conduction of that nerve, it's going to block both the sensory and the motor components, right? So we have to remember this as we think through, you know, what nerves we want to block. So probably not a good idea to do like a, you know, a proximal leg block, right? And then say, okay, you're good to go home because uh, they're probably going to have a difficult time moving some of the, the, the muscles of their lower extremity. Uh, so you got to think through as you're doing this, kind of what the implications are for not only the sensory distribution, but also the motor distribution. But in essence, we're, we're injecting a medicine around a nerve to make the nerve not work, right? We're given, um, we're giving the patient that pain control through that mechanism, right? So the benefit of this is we decrease the need for other forms of pain medication, particularly opiates, right? We all know that opiates can cause respiratory sedation, respiratory depression, uh, sedation, um, you know, long-term they can cause, you know, a potential for addiction and tolerance. Um, as well as, you know, stimulate some potential worsening of chronic pain if, if we do that. Um, and they're just for acutely painful procedures, not terribly that effective, right? You know, I've never was satisfied when I had a boxer's fracture, just loading them up with the lot and then pulling on the thing. They still are yelling at me, um, you know, just as badly as if I didn't. So uh, decreases the need for opiates and it also will decrease the need for procedural sedation. So while this takes some time to do, right? Um, in aggregate, it should take less time to do the ultrasound nerve block um, than it would take to get a nurse, go to a room, do your sedation, recover the patient, bring them back, and kind of the whole rigmarole of what that entails. And so um, there will be a time saving as well as a potential complication sparing aspect um, to doing fewer sedations and that we don't have to worry about respiratory depression and things to that effect, right? Now, we oftentimes do these under, well, we always do these under some form of guidance, right? Whether that be landmark guidance where you read Robertson Hedge and say, if you find this bony protuberance, inject at that site and it will block this nerve, right? Uh, or um, the, you know, the formerly traditional way is find some nerve stimulator, right? Try to stimulate that nerve, look at the, you know, the profile that you get on the nerve stimulator and say, yep, I'm there. And then inject your, your, your numbing medicine right around that area. Um, I don't have that. I've never trained on that. I don't do that. Um, so that's kind of a not an option for me. So the, the, the best option that we can propose, and I guess the, the reason for the rest of this talk um, is basically to say ultrasound is going to be a good way of guiding the, the um, procedure. Because not only can you see the nerve, but you can also see the needle. You can see your fluids going around the nerve and really know that you were at the right place. You didn't inject into a vessel. You got the, blood, the, the anesthetic agent right where you need it. Um, and you really can target that nerve and in essence um, have a more targeted, um, um, I guess, nerve block than you, than you could with just Landmark alone. So if you did Landmark alone, again, this has been historically what we've done as a practice, right? Um, but there, there can be some problems with that. Um, since you're going in blind, you can't see what, exactly what you're poking through and into. Um, so there's the risk of nerve injury, right? There's a risk of causing some nerve ischemia. So if you do an intraneural injection, 
um, you can almost create like a small compartment syndrome in that nerve where you increase the interstitial pressure uh, of that nerve. And then you decrease your diffusion capacity of all the capillaries that supply that nerve and create a little bit of local nerve ischemia. So there's just, that's a potential problem, right? Um, you can also inject intravascularly. You know, a small amount of lidocaine is probably not going to do a ton. You know, 100 milligrams of lidocaine is code epi or code lido. So you're trying to get someone to have a, a, a change in their dysrhythmia. You know, you have up to 100 milligrams of lido. Um, so if you're using that agent, probably not a big idea, or not you know untoward in terms of complications. But bupivacaine is you know quite cardiotoxic, and so if you get that intravascular, that's a big deal. Um, and so in general, when we're doing this procedure, we don't want to put the, the anesthetic agent into the vessel. Um, additionally, you can cause a hematoma formation, whether it be in the nerve or in the surrounding tissue, right? Uh, if you poke through a nerve, you poke through a blood vessel, um, that all of a sudden now is a, a place where it can leak and cause a hematoma, um, can, you know, complicate your procedure. And then obviously, you know, if you don't get it in the right place, that, that injection could just be plain old ineffective. You just, you basically anesthetize some subcutaneous tissue or muscle tissue, but didn't hit the nerve that you want. Um, so there's a couple different reasons why you may not want to do blind, um, which leads us to the ultrasound guidance, right? And so here's an example where you can see actually the needle and it's depoting a bunch of fluid right around that nerve, right? So if we look, let's see if I can get my cursor over here somewhere, maybe not. Um, we can see the, the nerve, you know, that bundle right kind of just to the right of the middle of the screen with that needle right underneath it, depoting that agent. Uh, so we get very much more targeted um, injection of anesthetic agent. So the benefits of doing an ultrasound guided nerve block um, are a number, right? It reduces the risk of injury to the vascular structures, right? It reduces that risk of intravascular injection. Uh, so it's a lot safer just to, you know, from that standpoint reduces injury to the nerve. So you can watch where that needle is and see it is in fact in the nerve or it's not in the nerve, right? Um, it reduces the risk of a compartment syndrome. If you have to put a, a lot of, lot of anesthetic agents, some of these, you know, large nerve blocks require, you know, 20, 30, 40 cc's of, of fluid. So it can reduce the risk of a compartment syndrome because you're using less fluid, right? Reduces the risk of that nerve compartment syndrome for sure. Um, it avoids further injury to the site. So you're not just blindly stabbing into something that's already injured. Uh, and the patients tend to like it a little bit better. If you use a smaller amount of agent in a very targeted way, uh, it's a lot less painful than just blindly stabbing around until you get, get the effect that you want, right? Now, this is well supported in the literature. Um, there's a number of papers that are out there. These are just a representative sample. Um, you know, this is an ultrasound versus landmark for sural nerve blocks of so the ankle. And they basically found that it, you get a, a more complete block uh, and it lasts longer. Right? It's a 2009 study saying better, stu better block, last longer, right, than, than compared to landmark. Here's another one, a tibial nerve block, um, you know, look at uh, the foot, um, ultrasound versus landmark, and they found it to be significantly more successful, 72% versus 22% uh, to get a complete block of the foot, you know, when you use ultrasound to guide it, right. Uh, 2015 study from some of the emergency people, right, so Arun Nagdev is one of the guys uh, who's out in the Pacific Northwest. He does a lot of ultrasound guided nerve blocks. Mike Stone's kind of got the ball rolling, um, about 10 years ago, uh, or no, not quite that far, uh, about eight years ago uh, with ultrasound guided nerve blocks in the emergency department. And they basically were looking at forearm blocks and they found better success with ultrasound um, versus traditional landmarks, you know, when they, when they did their, their blocks. So it's highly effective, right? Something that can be very easily be done, um, give you a good effect. Now, the question is, can we do this, right? Uh, so this is our credentialing packet, you know, core one privileges, peripheral nerve blocks, right? So I'm going to define peripheral nerve blocks as anything that's not central nervous system, right? So any peripheral nervous system. Uh, Chuck, if I'm wrong, you can correct me on that. But basically, um, a nerve block of a peripheral nerve would fall within our privileging. Um, and then under the ultrasound designation, right? Ultrasound guided procedures is part of the the, the privileges for level one ultrasound that everybody in the main campus ED has. And I'm working on getting that with the... Uh, the, the freestanding docs. Don't do uh, spinal so, facet blocks. I'm sorry? Don't do spinal facet blocks. Don't do final, spinal facet blocks. <laughs> um, so, but basically a peripheral nerve block falls within um, our privileging that we can do here in the emergency department uh, you know, for, for our patients. And so there shouldn't be a privileging issue in that context. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy, right? Central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, the two main components or main uh, aspects of our, you know, of, of the nervous system that we have. We're going to leave central to anesthesia. That's going to be epidurals, spinals, things like that. We don't want to do, I hate doing spinal taps. 
I certainly don't want to put an anesthetic agent in there. We're not going to do that, right? That's what we're not going to you know, focus on. But peripheral nervous system, there's a lot of different nerves that innervate different regions of the body that are accessible to us, um, either within a muscle plane, um, you know, or along the course of the nerve that we can access to provide specific anesthesia to specific parts of the body. And that's where we're going to focus, right? So if we break down the nerve all the way down to its core element, right, you have the nerve, nerve cell itself composed of the nerve body, right? Um, and then it has a series of axons and dendrites. So remember the dendrites are the little spinally things that come off the nerve body. The axon is the long, potentially myelinated structure that conducts that nerve impulse from point A to point B, right? So the axons can be quite long. Uh, if they're myelinated, it you know, can provide quite rapid nerve transmission. Um, and then, you know, all that processing happens in the cell body, you know, and then through the dendrites travels to the next, next nerve, essentially. Um, they're combined, um, as it comes out of the spinal cord, um, into the, the spinal roots, right? So you have your sensory or the afferent, uh, in the dorsal root, right? And you have your motor, the efferent in the ventral root, right? So these are going to be the roots that come out of the spinal cord, they're going to form the spinal nerve or like the nerve bundle that comes out and they're going to come out your foramen and then just branch off and go to wherever else in the body that you want. Right. Um, so we talked a little bit about nerve anatomy. We have the, the nerve body, the soma, the axon, the dendrites, they're going to be, the nerves themselves are going to be arranged in bundles. You know, it's going to be very similar to what we know to be true with muscles, right? Where you have the, the muscle fibers and the muscle bundles. Um, and they're going to be surrounded by some form of connective tissue. Uh, so you have your nerve fibers, that form a fascicle surrounded by your, um, you know, around by the, the um, I believe it's the endoneurium. Yeah, surrounded by the endoneurium, a couple of those little bundles, you know, with perineurium, all surrounded by the epineurium forming this, this nerve itself, right? So you can break that nerve down into the minim these minimal uh, cellular components, right? Now on ultrasound, we're gonna see just kind of the general nerve, right? Um, and this, this is what it looks like. The arrow is pointing right at it. And it's going to be basically a uh, hyperechoic bundle, generally speaking. It's going to have some um, anisotropy to it. So if you rock your probe back and forth, you're going to have some change in the echo texture. But it's going to have more of a coarse appearance than uh, what we're used to seeing with... Uh, sorry, Matt. Can you, can you explain that term you used? Anisotropy? Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, perfect. So anisotropy is a physical phenomenon that we see mostly with tendons, uh, we see it with striated structures, mostly the tendons to a lesser degree, but still with nerves. And that is when you angle your transducer. So you have your nerve, right? You angle your transducer. You need to have it perpendicular to get the best view, right? The angle of reflection is or the angle of incidence is the angle of reflection. So if I reflect down, I get the, the ultrasound beam to bounce right back up and I get a great view. For these very linear structures, if you move your transducer to an angle that's not perpendicular, that all of a sudden that ultrasound beam doesn't bounce back to the transducer, it bounces somewhere else, and we don't get much of a return. And so what we see in effect is a hyperechoic structure when we're perpendicular on it. And as we fan out to off perpendicular, where it's going to become hypoechoic, right? Um, and so that's the, the principle of anisotropy. Uh, and so in tendons, it could be challenging. Like if you're not perfectly on it, it will be hypoechoic. You may overread that as the partial tendon injury. Um, so for particularly, basically the bottom line is for, for nerves and for tendons, you want to be perfectly perpendicular on that structure. Um, and if you're not, just kind of angle back up to perpendicular and you'll see that brighten back up. Um, and if you don't, you'll kind of become hypoechoic. Does that make sense? So um, anyway, so yeah, thank you. If you look uh, at the nerve itself, it's going to have more of that coarse echo texture than a, than a tendon, right? Uh, and it's described as kind of this honeycomb appearance. So you see this triangular wedge uh, inside this, uh, or right at the tip of the, the arrow here. And this is basically the nerve. Uh, and that's going to be the appearance that it has. And oftentimes runs with blood vessels. So you'll see like the vein artery nerve. Uh, but sometimes you'll have nerves that run independently between muscle layers. Um, you know, so things to look for. In, in short axis, it's going to kind of have this oftentimes triangular honeycomb appearance in long axis, you know, it's going to be, you know, striated, it'll be a little harder to see, it will be striated much like a, a, like a tendon would be, um, you know, as you're looking at those, right? So those nerves, uh, as we get closer towards the central axis, right, are going to join up in certain plexi, uh, particularly around the neck, the, the, the axilla and around the, the lumbar area to form the cervical uh, brachial and lumbar plexus. And there's certain blocks that can, you know, block certain portions of the plexi, 
Um, but essentially most of what we're going to do is going to be a little bit more distal to kind of where these nerves join kind of intermeshed as they go back up into the central nervous system. But just to, you know, to recap, here's the cervical plexus, right? There's some cervical plexus blocks that, you know, can be done. Um, the brachial plexus, there's a lot of different blocks at various different points, um, in the, um, in the brachial plexus. One of them that's been talked about before is the interscaling block, which is high up in the cervical plexus. Um, and then the lumbar plexus, you know, as the, the nerve form. And then most of the blocks we do down here are way out in the periphery um, after it's, you know, exited the plexus and, you know, become, you know, a, a named nerve, like a you know, femoral nerve or sciatic nerve or things to that effect. So how do we block a nerve, right? Um, that's going to be the next, the next topic here. There are several indications for blocking nerves, right? The main one is acute pain management. I mean, that's why we're talking about this. Someone did something to themselves. It hurts. We need to do something to fix them, get them back, put back together. And we need to provide some form of pain control. Otherwise they give us really bad reviews and they go to some other hospital and the, you know, people get really mad at us, right? Um, so acute pain management, right? Painful procedures. These are indications to do the, the procedure. Uh, if for some reason, someone's not a candidate for procedural sedation, perhaps a, uh, a nerve block would be a better option. Um, I recently had a patient who was severely traumatized uh, and they had like an ASA classification that was off the charts and ortho wanted to do a reduction. I'm like, no way. Like this patient is barely holding onto their airway as it is. Like this is not going to happen. And I've had another patient who was like, if we're going to do a, a sedation on this guy, we're tubing him just because like, I can't maintain that airway, um, you know, with a sedation. So this may be an al you know, alternate way of being able to get the job accomplished uh, without having to, to revert to a sedation if that's you know, un unavailable, whether it be from a staffing standpoint or from a you know, patient um, comorbidity standpoint. And again, this is an alternate to providing a narcotic pain medication. Um, it's a way of providing a targeted approach to pain control for a limited period of time to do something to a patient and not having to use, utilize other options or other resources, right? So contraindications, obviously if they're allergic to the agent, don't use it, right? Kind of goes without saying. Um, you know, this is not the place where you're going to do your anaphylaxis challenge or, you know, give them a bunch of epi to <laughs> prevent their anaphylaxis. Don't, you know, like uh, if they're allergic, don't do it. If they have an infec infection at the injection site, you probably don't want to poke through that so you don't see the deeper infection, right? If they have a high risk for compartment syndrome and you need to do compartment checks, that may be a reason not to do it because you're going to get a pretty dense uh, anesthesia and the patient's not going to be able to tell you that they have pain that's worsening. So just as, a, as an aside, this has for a long time been a reason why we've had a lot of pushback in the department, particularly from orthopedics about doing blocks, right? They've been historically very hesitant to have us do these. Um, and you know, thanks to the leadership of Sam Tate when he was here, um, they made some inroads to, to be able to do like fascia iliaca blocks on ortho patients after ortho has evaluated them. Um, but just be mindful, like if you have a risk or an injury that's high risk for compartment syndrome, maybe not the thing you want to do, right? And certainly if they're anticoagulated, it's not a hard contraindication, but just think if you're, if you have someone who's, you know, high risk for bleeding and you're poking something that is a, as a relatively uncompressible site, that may be a reason why you, you know, may want to avoid doing a, a nerve block in that situation, right? So other complications that can happen as a result of the nerve block, right? Um, you can cause mechanical trauma to the nerve or to the surrounding tissues, right? Um, if you inject in and around the nerve, you can get some um, edema in the nerve um, or hematoma around the nerve, both of which can cause compressive effects. Um, like we talked about earlier, increase the interstitial pressure around the nerve and decrease the capillary diffusion um, and injure the nerve, right? And those are the pressure effects that we talked about. And obviously, um, you can give an, a toxicity of the particular agent that you're using if you're not careful with your dosing and particularly if you get an intravascular injection, right? So what equipment do we want? you know, essentially you're going to use your linear transducer, right? This is the high frequency, high resolution linear transducer. And it's basically the transducer that we're going to need to get the best resolution. Um, we don't need a lot of depth. We can do shallow because um, that's where oftentimes where these peripheral nerves are at, but it gives us a good resolution of the, the, the nerve and the surrounding tissue uh, and the needle. So we can really get a very targeted approach to, um, to the patient as we inject them, right? From a equipment standpoint, obviously you're going to need a syringe and needles. Um, this is when I originally put this lecture together, this is what we had. Um, we have subsequently obtained uh, some special block needles, um, which are really cool. So we have a two inch and a four inch option. Um, so needles that are designed to be used for blocking um, nerves. So it's a needle attached to some extension tubing, uh, which is great. So what I've been doing lately is grabbing one of those, grabbing, you know, a, a syringe. So usually I've been doing some bigger blocks, like a 30 cc syringe with, you know, with my agent. 
Um, and what's helpful is then you can use the needle with the extension tubing to get the needle where you need to go and then have a partner um, do the injection uh, once you get to where you go. So you can really focus on your, your transducer and your needle, get that targeted where you want to go and then tell someone, okay, inject a little bit, inject a little bit. Um, so you don't have this big old clunky syringe just making it harder to, to guide that needle. So you can get very much more precise uh, needle placement. Um, but you'll need some form of a syringe and needle. Um, you'll need some form of um, a um, material to, to sterilize the skin. Uh, if it's a superficial plane block, it doesn't necessarily have to be complete sterile, you know, technique, although, um, you know, sterile is oftentimes recommended. So depending on the, the, the complexity of the block, like if it's a plane block, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll sterilize the skin and then just don't touch the needle tip to anything that's not sterile, right? So it's that portion of sterile, but I'm not necessarily in, you know, complete sterile getup. Um, Oftentimes, though, what I'll do is put the, the probe itself in a sterile sheath, right? So we have sterile sheaths um, that are in the ultrasound cabinets. Um, so if you put this probe in that, you sterilize the skin, have the, you know, be careful with what you, what you touch. Um, that's really going to be sufficient for a lot of these, you know, plain blocks. If you want to do, you know, sterile drapes and all that, um, you know, you know, more power to you. Um, that's certainly a possibility. But this is kind of the minimum necessary uh, equipment that you're going to need to do this block, right? So for local agents, there's a variety of different agents that we can use um, And the factors that, you know, make each agent different is going to be kind of what you use to decide, you know, what you're going to, what you're going to use for the patient. So in essence, uh, just talking about a depolarization, we know that depolarization is basically dependent on sodium movement, right? So you have your, your nerve that's primed, right? There's going to be some, you know, old, you know, depolarizing potential that's going to happen, right? It's going to trigger those sodium channels to basically open up and you're going to have a massive inrush of sodium from the extracellular space to the intracellular space, it's going to cause that depolarization and that causes the next, you know, the next tier to depolarize and then, you know, so on down the line. And your sodium potassium ATPase pumps um, will then reset that, that sodium and that potassium um, distribution on the extracellular and the intracellular respective, you know, sides uh, to set you basically up for your next action potential, right? So it prevents, um, so what these agents do is they're sodium channel blockers that basically prevent that sodium channel from opening up. So you'll get some of these depolarizing potentials that happen, you use the next slide here, where you can see these depolarizing potentials that happen, you know, one, two, three, four, and, you know, obviously not five. Um, and if you block your sodium channel, those depolarizing potentials won't then translate into basically a, a, a nerve depolarization and you'll, you won't have that nerve stimulus that's passed. Uh, so that's essentially the goal of what these agents are going to do for us. Now, from a biochemical standpoint, it's basically an aromic moiety and a hydrophilic uh, segment that's going to be linked either with an amide or an ester linkage. And that's going to be all the different agents. And how you affect these, you know, these moieties that are on either side is really going to determine what the agent is um, and then you know, what effects those agents have. Now, there's other factors that affect the ability of the agent to work. So that's the, the pKa, um, which needs to be close to body, you know, body um, pH. Uh, the protein binding, right? So some of these agents can be more bound to protein than others, um, so which is why, you know, you may have a, a little bit more of an exaggerated potency in pregnant patients with, you know, the, the change in the, the protein binding. Um, and then the hydrophilic, hydrophobic nature of the agents, you know, they have to get through the lipid bilayer to be able to work. Um, so you can adjust that to affect the, the effectiveness. So all that to say, there's a number of different agents that are used um, you know, so you have procaine, which is a very short acting, you know, lidocaine, which we're really used to, um, relatively short acting. Um, and then, you know, longer actings, right? So your bupivacaine and the one that we have stocked here is ropivacaine, uh, but either of them have a similar duration of action. Um, so it takes a couple minutes to start, but then can last you, you know, eight, 12 hours, you know, you know, from the time of injection. So depending on what you want to do, if you're just doing a quick procedure, you just want something quick like lidocaine, which is quick on, quick off. Um, but if you want some lasting pain control, you may want to add in a bupivacaine. Um, so our dosing uh, is also, there's also, you know, specific dosing around this. Um, it's usually a max dose, um, oftentimes by body weight. Um, so for bupivacaine or ropivacaine, it's around that two milligrams, you know, per kilogram. Um, for lidocaine, it's going to be the four-ish milligrams uh, per kilogram, depending on whether you have epi or not. Um, so as we're getting into larger injections, you have to start doing some calculations in terms of what your patient can tolerate. So your average 70 kilo person, you know, getting bupivacaine, you can tolerate up to about 140 milligrams, um, which in our, you know, basically you'll see in our vial, you know, X percent concentration, 
uh, x equals x many milligrams and then if you need uh, more volume you can dilute that out with saline um, to give you the total volume that you need to give so you do have to be careful with your dosing in terms of the amount that you give so toxicity what happens if we give this in the wrong place or too much of it so think about it from this perspective if you block sodium channels in the body, sodium channels using a variety of things, but if you block sodium channels in the nervous system, right? Uh, peripherally, that's what we're going for, but centrally, that's not what we want, right? So if we block that, we're gonna start with some kind of restlessness, disorientation, tremor as we kind of approach that toxicity range. And then obviously we can um, you know, create seizures, right? So you're, you're blocking some of the, uh, the inhibitory neurons, right? Um, that you know allow seizures to start breaking through and then as you get further and further blockage of your sodium channels we're going to start blocking the, the the neurons in the brain right um causing some cns depression so peripherally if you think out in the cortical you know areas so some depression and then go go more central gonna be the last thing to go um is going to start getting some of that respiratory centers in the in the brain stem and then ultimately down to coma where they're just out um so there's kind of this this degree of toxicity that you may see at least from a neurologic standpoint if you switch over to the heart that's gonna be the other main organ system that's going to be affected um, think about it the same way. You're blocking sodium channels, and so what do sodium channels do? They allow they allow action to potentials to happen um, inside the heart. So you're going to initially see uh, some decreased electrical excitability, right? So you'll see decreased inotropy and chronotropy uh, in your patient. Um, and then from a vascular standpoint, you'll see some vasodilations. You can't hold that vascular tone. Um, and it's going to be, you know, at the end game, you're going to see some dis uh, conduction disruptions, right? So you're going to basically, your pacemakers aren't going to work so well, you know, precipitating all the way out to arrhythmia and then death, right? It's kind of the spectrum of toxicity uh, from a cardiac standpoint. So how do you treat this, right? Benzo, 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 benzo for, um, for patients who are having seizures. Uh, if you need, um, you know, further things that benzos don't work for, or if you need further control, you know, propofol uh, would probably be your next bet for seizures. For respiratory depression, basically ventilatory support. So intubate them if you need to support their respirations, um, you know, to try to, to try to maintain their, you know, their, the A's and the B's essentially until the, the agent wears off. From a cardiac standpoint, um, you know, you may need epinephrine to increase your kind of chron uh, inotropy and your chronotropy, right? Um, in end, you know, end scenario situations, you know, CPR, you know, if they're coding on you, I mean, that goes without saying, if they're coding, you're going to do CPR. Um, but you also want to give inner lipids, basically that um, the, the, the big uh, absorber um, of intravascular uh, toxicities. So uh, we should have these available in the ED if you have a patient that, you know, becomes toxic. Uh, to give inner lipid to these patients, um, you know, to rescue that and just to suck up all that the, the um, intravascular anesthetic agent that you can. A um, couple things to remember, though, if you're running a code, I know in the heat of the moment, we kind of get used to kind of running our protocols. If you're running a code for a patient who's lidocaine toxic, don't give lidocaine as their, as their anti-dysrhythmic, right? It's going to be counterproductive. You've already got too much on board, so giving more is not going to help you. Uh, so run the code sans your lidocaine, right? And probably best to avoid calcium channel blockers uh, to, you know, to prevent, you know, further worsening of their, um, basically their inotropy and their chronotropy um, as well. So that being said, let's talk a little bit about the technique. Um, let's see, how am I doing on time here? I'm doing good. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the technique and then just a couple peripheral blocks that we can take easily to the bedside today. Um, to, to help out the patients. So we want to do these in plane with the needle. We may be out of plane with the nerve, which is fine, right? Uh, we want to see kind of the structures around the nerve. We really want to see the needle in plane so we know exactly where that needle tip is at all times and actually watch that fluid go into the, the soft tissue around it to make sure we're getting a, a decent um, anesthetic injection around that nerve. Um, do it bevel up. It's going to help give you more absorption or reflective surface to just give you better, uh, better visualization. Um, just kind of know where your bevel's at. Um, so you advance towards, under ultrasound guidance, advance towards that nerve, right? Um, you know, definitely aspirate back before you inject to make sure you're not intravascular and then inject your medicine. And it should flow pretty freely. You shouldn't meet a ton of resistance, right? If you have a lot of resistance, you should stop, right? Um, you know, if you, if the patient, you know, screams out in agony, you know, uh, or you're just not, you really having to push hard, you should really question what your needle tip is in, find that before you start injecting to make sure you're not doing an intraneural injection, right? So here's an example. This is some one of our phantom trainers, a long axis approach with the needle. You can see the needles advancing towards the structure of interest here. Um, and we can, once we get close, we can inject, you know, right around there. 
Um, and the nice thing about this is it allows you to then you know, redirect your needle above and below that structure of interest and really bathe at least three sides of that and then just kind of let diffusion take it around to that fourth side and just block that nerve. All right, and as we inject the anesthesia, what you'll notice, um, you can actually do some hydro dissection um, you know, as you kind of go through and see where your needle tip is and just watch that nerve uh, or watch that anesthetic agent come out. So here we're seeing the, ne the nerve, the needle tip in the left side. We just inject a little bit and it starts dissecting those tissues out and we can kind of continue to inject that, that, um, that fluid kind of around the nerve uh, to, to get that where, where we want it. Now, one thing that I've found to be helpful is draw up your medication and let it sit for a few minutes. Because in the process of drawing it out of the vial, there's a lot of agitation of the fluid, which creates micro air bubbles in your tissue, in your fluid. And so if you inject that immediately into tissues, all you get is an air whiteout. Um, so let it sit, let all those micro air bubbles just kind of filter away um, and kind of diffuse out of, the out of that, that fluid in your syringe. So all you're injecting is fluid and you're going to have a much better visualization of where that fluid's going, um, you know, as you, as you inject into the, you know, into the tissue. So just a reminder, kind of to recap space repetition here, if you experience resistance, right, or the patient experiences severe pain as you're injecting, stop, right? Really ask yourself where you're at and, um, you know, where you need to go to fix the, you know, you know, to fix your, your injection. Um, because if you feel that resistance, you have severe pain, you got to question, make sure you're not in the nerve itself. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit about a couple of different forearm blocks that can be helpful, right? So three in particular. The first one is the ulnar nerve, right? So the ulnar nerve is the mixed motor and sensory nerve, right? It runs medial to the ulnar artery between the artery and the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, right? And it divides about five to centimeters proximal to the wrist. So you really want to get proximal to that division, right? Because uh, if you get if you're too far distal, you don't hit proximal that division. You may not get a complete block of that nerve. So find the ulnar nerve, scan back to kind of somewhere five to ten centimeters back from the wrist, and that's going to be the site of injection uh, for that for that nerve. It's going to really hit up this lateral, or I guess it'd be medial aspect if you're doing anatomic um, orientation. But the 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 fourth and the fifth uh, fingers, it's going to hit fit the fifth, fourth. You're going to vary from person to person how much of it's going to hit. But if you have it. Um, you know, an issue over in that area, it's a great nerve or a great block to do. Um, so here's an example. The, you know, the structures are highlighted uh, with the arrows here. So the ulnar artery uh, is listed there uh, in red, right? The flexor carpi ulnaris tendon, right? Is there in green. So you basically find those two structures and somewhere in the middle is going to be that honeycomb triangular shape appearance of the ulnar nerve, uh, which is indicated by the yellow arrow there. You can scan proximally uh, five to 10 centimeters and use that as the site where you're going to inject and then just follow, you know, figure out your trajectory of your needle and watch that go in towards the ulnar nerve, right? So here's an example as we scan more proximally, um, it will eventually separate from that artery. So right here is probably going to be a pretty decent place to do the injection where we have a little bit of a safety tolerance where we aren't going to accidentally inject right into that ulnar artery. Does that make sense? All right, so the next one that we're gonna talk about is the median nerve, right? This is a really easy one to block because there is no vascular structure that goes nearby. So it's actually very safe to do. Um, the biggest complication you're gonna have is just in, uh, anesthetizing a, a tendon in the same vicinity, um, which will be of no effect to you um, because there's just a lot of those, the tendons that run in that same area. So the median nerve is a mixed motor and sensory nerve, right? It runs between the flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor digitorum profundus muscles uh, in the, the volar aspect of the forearm, right? So as you get towards the carpal tunnel, the distally out towards the wrist, it's gonna be in that spaghetti bowl of tendons, right? So it's really hard to differentiate at the wrist what is actually the nerve. So what I usually recommend is go transverse at the wrist, right? Put your probe down and then scan proximally. So if you start up at the wrist, let me grab um, a cell phone, which is my proxy for a, a, a probe, right? You start at the wrist and then scan back, right? Scan proximally. And what you'll see is a whole spaghetti bowl of tendons. And eventually the tendons turn into muscle and all you're left is with, all you're left with is the median nerve. Right? It's gonna be in the middle of the forearm. So you're gonna inject, somewhere down here uh, to, to block that median nerve, right? So 
uh, the distribution is going to basically be the rest of the palmar surface of the hand. So whatever that the ulnar nerve doesn't hit of the fourth, all the way through the thumb and the palmar, palmar surface. And then you may get a little bit of the tips of the fingers, um, you know, of those respective fingers as well uh, on the dorsal side. So here's an example. The flexor digitorum superficialis is marked out in green with the median nerve marked out in yellow. And then the muscle that's just deep to the muscle, the, the median nerve is going to be the flexor digitorum profundus, right? And you're going to be really in the middle of the, the forearm, you know, between the wrist and the elbow. Um, so here, as we're scanning back kind of at the spaghetti bowl of tendons, right? And they're going to eventually just flatten out and become the, the different muscles. And all we have left right in the middle of the screen is that triangular shaped honeycomb appearance uh, of the median nerve. So right there, right? We see all that's left is that median nerve. And that's a great place to then block it because if you don't get it completely around the nerve, all you do is just inject some into the muscle there. And the final nerve that we're going to do is the most challenging of the forearm blocks. Uh, it's going to be the radial nerve. So again, this is a mixed motor and sensory nerve. Uh, it travels with the radial artery. Um, it's very difficult to see out distally. And so oftentimes it's blocked way back proximally here um, underneath the brachioradialis muscle, which is probably the best place to see it. Um, it separates from the radial artery about seven centimeters proximal to the wrist. Um, and it divides uh, kind of near that wrist. So again, you, want, you don't want to do out distally. You want to get it more proximal so you get a full block of that radial nerve. Or radial, yeah, radial nerve. Uh, so here's an example of that division, right? If you get it too far out, you're only get like a portion um, you know, of the nerve. So it's going to basically innervate the rest of the hands, so the dorsal aspect of the hand kind of on the thumb, you know, through the fourth fingers uh, is what you're going to hit. Now, interestingly, you may need to block multiple nerves if you're doing an injury to the hand, depending on where it is and what it is and how deep. Um, I had a patient with a foreign body removal years ago that was like square in the middle of the hand. So I blocked one of them, I think to block the, the median. Um, and their pain on the palmar surface got better, but then their pain transferred to the, the dorsal surface of their hand. And basically, because I left the radial nerve unblocked, right? Um, so if you do you know, stuff on the palmar surface, the median should be fine. If you do stuff exclusively on the, the um, dorsal surface, the, ra the radial should be just fine. But if you have something that could be hitting both, you may need to block both nerves. Uh, just keep that in mind. So here's a scan um, or the, the ultrasonographic or the sonographic anatomy. So you can see the radial artery um, as listed in red there, the brachioradialis muscle kind of in green and the radial nerve just adjacent to that, um, you know, listed out in yellow. Uh, so as we go real time, you can see the, the artery. Um, as we scan around, you can see that nerve just to the left of it. Uh, it's a lot harder to see, but here it's going to start separating a little bit. Um, we loop back in kind of towards the end of this clip. You can see it's starting to separate out just a little bit, um, but it's right underneath that brachioradialis muscle. And that's going to be where you want to inject your anesthetic to block this nerve. So let's see. So just to recap here, um, nerve blocks are great adjunct to our pain control armamentarium. It's a tool, good tool to have in the toolbox. It decreases the dependence on um, PO or parenteral medications, uh, can increase the patient satisfaction, kind of decrease our throughput times potentially if we don't have to do a sedation, certainly decrease, decrease our, um, our staffing utilization if we don't need to you know, grab an extra room, grab an extra nurse. Um, it allows us to depot an anesthetic agent around that nerve, right? Um, to get a very much more targeted approach to, to the patient. Uh, probably a good idea as we're doing these, uh, particularly for large volume blocks and uh, proximal blocks to have them on a monitor so we can monitor them. Some of these peripheral blocks, probably not as important, uh, especially if you're using like a small dose of lidocaine. Uh, but as we get the 20, 30, 40 cc's of something, you know, more proximal in, um, you know, putting them on a monitor is not a bad idea to monitor for our toxicities. Remember that ranged from restlessness to seizures to, you know, CNS depression um, to coma. Uh, and then on a cardiac standpoint, from cardiac um, instability or hemodynamic instability all the way down to dysrhythmias. Um, and then as you think through your patients um, in the, the procedures and what needs to be done, consider adding these to your um, to your tool chest, right? So the radial, the ulnar and median nerve blocks for peripheral stuff. And then um, as we kind of explore more of these uh, larger blocks, we can add those to the, the toolkit as well.